Good morning, everybody. Well, welcome to our final session for spring 2018. And I hope when you came in, you picked up a sheet on the back table that is our schedule for fall. There's a couple of things I really do want to point out to you. First of all, let me thank you for giving the feedback that you did at the end of this last fall when we did our little evaluation so that uh, much of what is coming up in fall is framed based on uh, what you wanted to see and some of your recommendations. So thank you for that. A couple of things going on this fall, though. It is the 145th anniversary of the great yellow fever epidemic in Shreveport of 1873. And many of you know that there were five priests and uh, three sisters here in Shreveport who died, who actually gave their lives in that, in that effort. And so one of the things we'll be doing this fall is sort of concentrating on looking at that history. So two sessions are devoted to that. The other thing, of course, is that it is the 400th anniversary of the journey of our patron, St. John Berkman, uh, to Rome. And so we'll be doing some, some things throughout the fall about that as well. So be sure that you pick up one of these on the back table if you don't have it already and plan to be here. A couple of you have already asked if we can't do something during the summer, we'll think on it. Okay? Um, I promise I'll give that some thought. All right. And I think that um, you want Dottie to come make her announcements? Dottie, you had some things you wanted to announce as well? But let me just say thank you again for being here. Thank you for participating. Thank you for your feedback and your interest. And keep coming back. I'd like to excuse me, thank all of you that have donated breakfast, the goodies and everything. Uh, it's wonderful and thank you and we will, I'm sure we'll have some goodies next uh, fall. Uh, the Yellow Sheet Family Life and 50 Plus Group, these are the activities that will be going on. So if you'll look at them and put, put save the date, put them on your calendar because we have a lot of good things going on coming up for the summer and the fall. Thank you. <laughs> Well, today's talk is uh, supposed to be all about St. John Berkman's and the miracle of Grand Coteau, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about as well, and to uh, see if you would endure with me, is looking through my photo album <laughs> of the past month. Don't worry, you're not going to have to look at everything. But there are a few things that I do wish to show you about uh, an unbelievable pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and then an opportunity to stop in Rome, uh, concelebrate Mass with our Holy Father, and then also to enter into the Vatican secret archives, where I saw some of the canonization proceedings for our patron saint, which brings us back to the original topic. Remember, this whole semester has been dedicated to the miracles and um, uh, we took a, a look at it from a theological standpoint, philosophical standpoint, uh, 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 historical. And so it brings us then to this day in our, our final gathering of the semester. So one of the things that I'm getting the most uh, questions about happens to deal with uh, the visit with uh, Pope Francis. And so what I would like to do is show you a one minute video and also remind you that uh, there's so much on Rome Reports. It, it, it's, a, it's a website, romereports.com, and you're able to see basically a daily, well, what's going on in the life of the church, at least uh, in the Vatican, who is the, the Pope greeting, uh, who are the heads of state coming in, the cardinals he's meeting with. Um, just things of that nature. Sometimes it, it can be rather boring and uh, same old, same old. Other times it, it can be very interesting, like when your pastor makes the video. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's to hoping we have audio as well. Pope Francis in his homily, Cousins of the Marta spoke about choosing to follow the Christ by faith and to remember <laughs> Those the are my hands, by the way. <laughs> Sorry about 
about the audio? Di una volta che there's a cardinal. Io vedo le cose che Gesù ha fatto per me. Mi faccio la seconda domanda. E cosa devo fare per Gesù? E così con queste due domande forse riusciremo a purificarci di ogni maniera di fede interessata. He continued saying that this way of thinking should instill a desire to change. It's the road to conversion by love, he says. Since God has given each person so much love, everyone should give him their love. So, all of that kind of Pope Francis, in his homily, Casa Santa Marta spoke about choosing to follow Christ by faith and to remember the wonderful things he's done in each person's life. Okay, anyhow, so. Seen some. Um, so um, basically, what happened was I knew I would be in the city of Rome, and I just decided I'm going to write to the Pope. I wrote to the Pope two years ago and said, "Hey, the heart of St. John Berkman's is leaving Belgium for the first time in 395 years. We're going to have it here, and I would ask for you to grant an apostolic blessing and uh, plenary indulgence, all that we talked about the last couple of years." Uh, for those who come and venerate the heart of our patron. And I got a letter back, not literally signed by him, but from the Secretary of State, um, uh, stating that the Pope knows very well what is going on in Shreveport, Louisiana, and, and willingly uh, uh, imparts his apostolic blessing to all, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I wrote him again and asked for the opportunity to come celebrate Mass with him, and I got the letter back saying no. Uh, I wrote a second time and got the letter back saying no. Uh, but there was a flaw in the logic of the, of the personal secretary of His Holiness, and I uh, tactfully pointed that out in a third letter that I wrote. And all of a sudden, I got a fax, a one-page fax, from the Apostolic Palace saying, show up at this time and this place, and you get to have... Uh, yeah, and please come celebrate Mass with the, His Holiness. So, so I just went to the um, mailbox there in the, in the church office and just kind of started reading the mail, looked at this fax. So, I mean, it just really kind of blew me away. And I, I presented that to the Swiss Guard as we, uh, uh, about, what, about 50 people entered into the, I wouldn't even say 50, entered into the Pope's private chapel. Now afterwards, um, we all lined up. The cardinal got to go first, the bishop got to go next, and then there were eight of us priests, and I was in the middle of them. And, and so, what did, I, what did I mention to him? I, I said, I said uh, something that no other human being has been able to say to him. I am the rector of the Cathedral of St. John Berkman's. There is no other cathedral in the world, and I know that he is a Jesuit priest, become Pope, and of course our patron was a Jesuit, which we'll talk about later with regards to the canonization process, and so, and even as Pope, Pope Francis has uh, referenced our patron saint. So I mention that to be one huge hook to be able to engage him in uh, albeit a very brief conversation, um, and, and there are a couple of pictures, and I think you already saw that on Facebook and all. So that was my experience with uh, Pope Francis and his little uh, chapel, and any questions? Yes, Amy. What language did you speak? In Espanol. Si, como no. I, I, Rehearsed it in my mind. <laughs> you understand what he said, but he replied. <laughs> and I did understand what he said when he replied. Um, but, um, but again, I, I just thought that that would be a, a, a quick, easy way. I, the entire Mass was in Italian. 
And I mean, every bit of it, uh, all the, the parts of the mass, the, the singing, the, um, was in Italian. So. And I think everyone else was speaking with him in Italian. Um, there were actually two Americans in the room. One of the other priests was a priest from Alabama who was celebrating his 40th anniversary and he was studying in Rome at the time and petitioned uh, the Holy Father for the opportunity to celebrate Mass and he did. Yes? Um, it may come to me. It has a German last name. He's from Birmingham um, or from the Diocese of Birmingham. Uh, he's, in the, he's in the picture. Uh, I've never seen it look like that. So then what happened immediately after that was uh, that was at 7 a.m. in the morning, then left and went directly uh, to the Vatican secret archives. Something happened with our video? Um, <coughs> it looks like it's recording. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it went to the Vatican secret archives, as many of you know, uh, Dr. Cheryl White and I uh, petitioning uh, December of last year for the opportunity to go into there. And believe it or not, you can actually make this petition online. You make the request, you present your credentials, you uh, tell them very specifically what it is that you want to do. And uh, I was the 833rd person who was able to, to gain access this year of, of the Vatican secret archives. It's, it may sound like a lot, but it's compared to the number of people who actually uh, are approved. Um, I, I was quite amazed. And when you walk into the Vatican secret archives, I want you to have a sense of, so someone notice the Game of Thrones thing here. If you are at all familiar with the Game of Thrones, hopefully many of you are not. <laughs> no, I've never seen it. Wow, this is very dark. Um, yeah, but doesn't it brighten up when he enters the library? So, yeah, but you should be able to see all these old books. I mean, it's better right here. Look right here. <laughs> <laughs> It looked nothing like that. <laughs> I thought it was going to be something like that, where you walk in and there are all the old documents, and there's the Galileo papers, and here's uh, everything going back to all, all the early popes and the, the uh, current uh, popes. Um, so this is what, what it is. You walk in, you have to show your card four times. There's four layers of security before you even get in. First of all, you have to surrender your passport to even get this card. I got the card right here if anyone wants to look at it. Um, and then once you get inside and you go up to the third floor, you walk into this area where, and it even says, um, the Hall of indices or indexes, whichever you prefer. Um, and it's this, it's this rather large library, just regular library looking room with, with pretty large volumes in there. And a lot of it is the old script from the, the time in which you are actually examining. And it's all the, it's all the references to everything <coughs> that they have inside the actual archives. What you do is once you find that reference and that is not as easy as it sounds. I mean, we spent like the first day just looking at those books, and we always had to refer back to them and, and try to find a different reference. So you, you find the, the, the code that tells the people who go all the way deeper into the Vatican archives, which is where I wanted to, to literally walk and see, see everything that must have been more akin to that. Um, mm -hmm. 
And so you, you find that, you sit down at a computer, you enter that in, and you have to be very specific and exact, and then you, you put your, your number in there, your last name, uh, push send, it tells you if it was sent. At one point, I had made too many requests. <laughs> the second day, there was too many requests, and it said, in Italian, you've made too many requests, no more volumes for you. <laughs> you know? And I was rather surprised, but it, it's, it's one of the ways in which they keep from people just going in and just kind of looking up historical things and not doing research. You know, you can't just get things just to look at it. Yes, I looked at it. This is great. And by the way, of course, I think it should go without saying that there's no photography. Um, one of the videos that I'll, I'll show you in, in just a minute um, uh, got a little too close to the front entrance and, and they said something. Um, and you'll see a Swiss guard uh, who is a little upset that we got too close with the video camera going. But um, that's all right. <laughs> um, turned it off. And, and so, then what happens is it, it may take upwards to 30 minutes for them to track down whatever it is that you're looking for. I mean, they're going to some, uh, some of the huge rooms in the back uh, that um, and some of these documents haven't been looked at in who knows how long. Some of the ones we were looking at haven't been looked at for decades. And I think that was part of what uh, intrigued the Vatican uh, secret archive officials is that we were we, we weren't just interested in okay we want to see the Magna Carta, you know, um, we we were really truly genuinely there to do the research. Then they they get the, the then you, there's a, an adjacent room, and by the way there were like seven people there working working with us for us helping us. Um, uh, anytime we had questions, you just go to them, ask, and they point you in the right <coughs> direction. And um, um, th then that, that room right next door, they don't call your name, by the way, when, you, when the volume arrives. You know, you just have to kind of keep checking in, and then all of a sudden, okay, then they give it to you, and quite literally hand you this book from the 12th century, uh, or whatever documents. There were people... Uh, I would say maybe 15 to 20 people who were looking at some of the Vatican, uh, at, at their documents as well, and some of them were uh, parchments that were opened up. Uh, you could bring your computer, and, and some of them were literally looking at the text and, and trying to decipher the, the text, and one letter at a time, they were entering it in. And then they were going to, at some point, uh, go and... and uh, uh, make a translation of it or something, but and 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 you can only have um, uh, one volume at a time in order to to research. So, Chris, well, you don't have to wear special gloves no. to touch the parchment. One would think, but uh, we weren't. We never requested any of the the parchments. Uh, we had the old books, so we at no point had to use gloves. Okay. But some of those parchments, uh, I don't. I don't think that they literally give you to, to see. You get to look at it, or uh, a number of the ones had already been, um, e each page had been uh, digitalized. It was like, in fact, they were JPEGs. So the, there were photographs, high-powered, beautiful photographs of these pages. And so if you, if you requested that document and it was already on on CD, it went to another room. Downstairs, you had to go there, had all of the computers set up, and I wanted them to hand me one of those CDs, and I mean, we couldn't even look at them. You know, for fear that a priest or a professor at LSU or someone would just run off with it, go make a copy of it, bring, back, bring it back later or something. I, I'm, I'm sure that there's a legitimate fear that something like that may actually happen. So what the guy does is he loads it over there, and then you're sitting at a, a, one of about 12 uh, monitors, and then you get to, then it comes up on your screen, and you get to look at the document that you're looking at, 
of the digital uh, version of it. But super quality, great um, quality. Yes? Are you only allowed to sell it while you're there? So uh, their hours were from 8.30 until 5, if I recall, or 5.30 maybe. Um, and it's only in the morning that you could make a request for one of the volumes. In the afternoon, I found this out the first day, the afternoon I went to the same computers to enter in what it was I was looking for, and I was like, oh, sorry, you can't request anything in the afternoon. You have to have already done all that work in the morning, and the research is taking place in the afternoon. A number of the people had their little sack lunch, and at a certain point went downstairs, went into the courtyard, um, and just ate their, their lunch, or you could literally leave the Vatican and go and eat somewhere and come back um, and recheck in, put all your, the first thing you did when you, you checked in, you had to go upstairs to this little uh, room with a whole bunch of lockers and you're given a key to a locker, that's your number for the day, and you had to put all your bags, purses, uh, whatever you had um, in there, and, um, there were cameras everywhere too, as you can imagine, even there. And no cell service, they scrambled the cell service. Uh, scrambled the cell service, wow. you know. They did allow you to have um, uh, phones and all, but only in as much as that was where you were taking your notes. You know, same with iPhones and other things. What <coughs> language were these documents written in? Practically all of the documents were in Latin but not exclusively. Sometimes the, the correspondence, so for example, the St. John Berkman's documents that I saw, as a result of the miracle in Grand Coteau, 1866, and by the way, when I submitted that uh, reference into the computer, the first thing that came up is, uh, uh, this has nothing to do with what you said that you wanted to say. <laughs> And I'm surprised I didn't. <laughs> I, I just, you know. <laughs> so the, the first day uh, we had nothing to do, and uh, Cheryl and I walked around for about, um, well, eight miles, eight plus miles, and it felt great, no problems. The next day I'm sitting down in front of a computer or, or all these books for eight hours, and I was exhausted, <laughs> you know. And so at a certain point I was like, okay, I'm exhausted. I know what I'm going to do. I, I want to look at the St. John Berkman stuff. And so, boom, no, you can't. <laughs> and actually, I was, I didn't even tell you, but it, um, the, it said another person was looking at these documents. I was like shocked. I was like, who? I, I, I'd like to know. <laughs> you know. No, I promise it wasn't. <laughs> so, uh, but I still hit continue. And, uh, and sure enough, the, the documents came, and, um, and the documents were in Latin and French. 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 Down in Grand Coteau, uh, out in New Orleans, the, the, uh, the bishop's stationery was in, in French. Um, this is the uh, 1866, and, and it was a, I, I would say, kind of a box you know, about that, that thick, and then you could open it up, open up the box, and then it's a book that they basically made a volume out of it. You open up the page, and then here is the envelope that was sent from New Orleans with all the stamps, and, and all the handwritten, everything. I mean, it was the original, it was what was presented for the canonization process in, in which they stated this is a miracle that had taken place. And remember when we had the heart um, here at St. John's, this room had been transformed and we got to see some of the documents uh, regarding the, the canonization process. Copies of the documents is what we saw. And I mean, they're all kept right there at, at the Vatican. And there are several big volumes with regards to the the, the rights uh, of, of canonization, all, all of the different processes that have taken place since the 12th century, 
because of the congregation well, no, for 16th century. 16th century, yeah. thank you. Since the 16th century, um, because before that, there was no congregation for the cause of saints, as we have right now. You know, the, the sisters, uh, the Indian sisters we have here, their founder, I'll talk about it at next 8 o'clock mass, because they're going to be there. They don't know I'm going to say anything, so don't say anything. Uh, I'm going to talk about their founder, because he was just declared venerable. And so don't even congratulate them yet. It has to be next week, all right? Um, but I, I want to highlight them and their ministry and what their founder did. And so at some point, it will end up in the, well, I'm sure the, the initial part has already been uh, put into some type of an index of the canonization papers, all of the processes. Uh, that went into his being declared venerable and then hopefully blessed and then hopefully a saint uh, later. Now, one of the things that we wanted to look up in the Vatican archives was all about the Shroud of Turin and trying to find the missing years of the Shroud. So we are 99% sure, not we, the two of us, the, the whole Shroud world, uh, <laughs> Uh, pretty convinced that the Shroud was in Constantinople in 1204 at the time of the Fourth Crusade and the sack of Constantinople. Um, sad part of our Christian history, but it is a part of it. Um, so, and, and so for 141 years, we don't know for sure the whereabouts of the Shroud. And so in 1204, the Pope, Innocent III, the Shroud of Turin, of course we call it of Turin now, it wasn't called that then. Um, most likely, wouldn't you think the Pope might have a sense of where it was, or some of the more higher up Vatican officials, or the king, King Saint Louis the Ninth? Because all of a sudden, uh, it, it emerges, the Shroud it emerges in the mid 1300s in France. The king bought the crown of thorns. <coughs> Anyone here been to Paris and seen uh, Saint-Chapelle? Yes. Yes. Pretty spectacular, right? Cheryl, what was the, the, the fact on the cost there? Mm -hmm. Oh, that it cost, um, he paid twice as much for the crown of thorns as it cost to build uh, Saint-Chapelle. Oh. He paid twice as twice much, as much to purchase for the relic. The, this relic, or uh, let me be more precise, he offered a donation right. uh, worth twice the amount that it cost to build Saint Chapelle in which he wanted to house it. Saint Chapelle, an unbelievably spectacularly beautiful chapel, the stained glass windows, uh, everything uh, pretty. Pretty spectacular, and, and he had other things as well. So, so these were the type documents that we were looking at, wanting to find some type of a <coughs> reference to the shroud, um, a, a, a list of the relics. Uh, we're, we're, we still think that we're hot on the trail. No, we didn't find anywhere the word shroud or any of the related words. Um, not yet. Not yet. It, it, it's out there somewhere. It's out there, and we're going we're going to find it. We were only there for three days, and we needed at least 30 to start, properly start the research. Um, any other questions about the Vatican Secret Archives before I move on? Why don't they make this more available? I understand keeping the original documents, but why do they not want to <coughs> sell copies of the documents? Why do they not want to sell copies of the documents? For uh, researchers, you know. Right, or, or turn them into books that could be sold. Um, First of all, it's huge, it's extensive, it's massive. Uh, I can't imagine how much time it takes to take just one of the volumes and each page do a copy. I wish they would. In fact, we were able to request scans of certain uh, pages and we will, uh, we will get those. Um, and I hopefully, and hopefully it's not too far in the, in the future, something like that will be available where people who have the proper, I don't know, either proper credentials or you just buy the book 
I don't think that just because it says Vatican secret archives that it's something that, well, we need to keep it a secret. You know, Pope Francis himself <laughs> has, has brought to light many of the documents that had been kept even more classified, maybe that's a, um, uh, with uh, documents that deal with the name of God. I don't know if you saw about that a couple of years ago. Um, but the sacred name, I mean, how to refer to God. We know in the Old Testament, it, it says Yahweh. I am who am, uh, Yahweh. Um, um, if there was anyone uh, who was an Orthodox Jew in the room right now when I said that, they would have gone ballistic. Because I just said the name uh, of God. Um, and it's, it's not supposed to be um, spoken. It, um, um, of, of course, we will pray to God and, and we'll talk about God and refer to God. Um, but anyways, there's a whole section there that Pope Francis has, has made even more readily available for people to look at, to, to study, to reference. But so much of the Vatican secret archives, it is available to those who are um, <coughs> properly credentialed. Now, a lot of the things in there, by the way, uh, are public. A lot of the people who are in there doing doctoral dissertations and other things, they, they write about it. They might have scans in their dissertations. They might have uh, whatever. Um, but, but just don't think that there's like some big huge uh, conspiracy type stuff that the Vatican is hiding and doesn't want people to know about. You know, uh, some of you heard about the whole Knights Templar and all the processes that, that took place with them and uh, people weren't able to find in the archives anything with regards to it and it's like, okay, the Vatican's covering it up. It's crystal clear. Uh, do you know what happened? Uh, how, how long ago? What about five? It's about, no, about 2007, about 11 years ago. 11 years ago, this, this one... Uh, uh, researcher, this woman was in there asking for something else. She she tapped into a um, an area of research that hasn't been uh, looked into for quite some time. She opens it up. She starts reading. It's the process of the Knights Templar. It was misfiled. It had been completely, totally misfiled. She's reading something that people haven't seen for ages, and. And uh, it's, it's now come to light. And all of that is, is uh, published, by the way. There are 799 copies of the, of the process of Knights Templar. Shreveport, Louisiana has one of them. <laughs> Norton Art Gallery. They have one of the 799, why it's not 800, I don't know. 799 copies worldwide. We have one in Shreveport. If you go to look at that copy, by the way, you will have to wear gloves. <laughs> and, and it is beautiful. Uh, Dr. White and I uh, were able to see it. Kind of sort of train our eyes to get ready to read some of the, uh, that script. Can I add something? Sure, definitely. There, it is sort of easy, though, to, to sort of buy into that conspiracy idea, I think, a little bit. Because one of the things that we were looking at... Um, one of the things that we were looking at was the canonization, or looking for the canonization of, of King St. Louis IX in some of the papers of Pope Boniface VIII, who was, of course, a Pope that, when the year he was canonized. And there we found the reference to the documents, but it was in a margin note. And in the margin note, it referred to a specific curial register and so when Father Peter went to ask about this specific curial register, we were told that, did they tell you first it was not available or they couldn't find it? Do you remember, Father Peter, which, point, which they said? Right. Not available or couldn't find it. The curial register. Remember the one that was in the right. little margin note? Couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. And so, you know, you, you, it's easy to see how people would say, well, they're hiding something from me. Because you, you've got this extensive, massive archive and you can't find this one thing. But, uh, but I do really believe that in the case of this was 13th century document, I probably believe that's true, that it's, it's in a register that they really don't know where it is. Or maybe it doesn't even exist anymore, but anyway. Okay, back to you. Back to me. Thank you very much. Were any of you
you able to watch any of the videos on uh, Facebook regarding the entrance into the Vatican secret archives? I did. Very few people. <coughs> well, plenty of other people. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's about uh, 2,000 people have uh, viewed it. Uh, actually, the first one, it's up to like 4,000 people watching, and now it's about to be 4,000 <laughs> I just need to figure out which of these. I think this is the one. That's it. Yeah. yeah. It's only 46 seconds. Well, this is a day, the first day of our three days in the Vatican Secret Archives. We're going to go inside. This is the Porta Santana. There's some of the Swiss Guard. They're in their blue uniforms today, not their, their regular ceremonial uniforms. We're going to go inside, and then we're going to take a left. We're getting our credentials today. A very exciting moment as we're preparing to look at 13th century documents, all about the canonization of Pope, excuse me, King St. Louis the Ninth, and then we'll also look at some of the things with regards to Pope Innocent III. So we want to find out more and more about the Shroud of Turin, the missing years uh, from 1204 to the mid-1300s. So um, this is super exciting, and I really can't wait to see what we're going to see on the inside. All right. I forgot. Um, these are individual. What we did was we uh, copied them all together so I wouldn't have to do this. <laughs> oh, it only took five minutes. We made our way in, got the, the secret archives passed, and now we're going to make our way through this um, arch all the way up here. Take a right, there's the Vatican Library, then the next door is uh, where the Vatican Secret Archives are. Hopefully we'll get another video over there at some point. I'm sure they're going to tell us that we have to turn it all off, but this is this is so super exciting. I, I just can't try it. Can't wait. All right, come on in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Better than pictures, huh? Maybe I can access the other. I was going to say, are they, are they in order that we did them? Yeah, you did the best with the next There's one. There's the archives right there. Here it is. We're in the entrance itself. The archives. And, uh, well, my goodness. So first thing I have to do is get a card. I, I can't just use this. They're going to give me a photo ID to, so that I'm able to actually get in for the next three days. And I get to keep it forever. I'm <laughs> uh, looking forward. Oops. Sorry. Sorry. So that one was a boring one. I know that was when they were calling your name. Oh yeah, that's when they call my name and I have to turn around and say bye. Um, I'm, um, yeah, this is the next one. All right, well that concludes day two in the Vatican Secret Archives. Uh, it's been quite a day. My goodness, it was so hot in there. I feel great out here. And what a view to come out and see uh, St. Peter's Dome in the background. Uh, it's really pretty, pretty neat. We were able to kind of hone in on documents of uh, letters of Pope Innocent III uh, with regards to the sack of Constantinople in 1204. Because that's that's the time that we that we lose the written record regarding the Shroud of Turin, and and we know that there's some type of a list out there. But we just hope that there's a list of all the different type uh, relics that were that were taken or given or whatever happened to them. I mean, that, but we're there. So we still have day three tomorrow. Uh, whew, a couple of days ago, Dr. Cheryl White and I walked. I already said that. Just one more. Actually, maybe two. Um, Do you have the one where the Swiss guard shushed us? <laughs> it's probably this one right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to the down. <coughs> okay. Well, just like that, now we finally made our way back in. Oh. And uh, <laughs> in fact, I guess you. All you get to see there are the number two uh, lead pencils uh, that we have to take in. Yes, number two lead pencils. Those are about the only thing That's that we need by the Vatican uh, archives. Um, so we're going to make our way here. Um, I like the license plates. 
SCV, Stato Città Vaticano. So they have their own license plates because we're now back inside the Vatican City. Anyhow, all right, just kind of take a look around the back side of the app. All right, anyways, I, I want to show you. Yeah, it would have been the one right before that. Right, right, right. This will give you a sense of where the part is. Okay, I've already made my way outside of St. Peter's. Uh, here's a beautiful um, St. Peter's Square, the whole colonnade here, the obelisk, and of course, the beautiful St. Peter's itself. And so what we're going to do is a number of you asked where are the Vatican Secret Archives located, so I'd like to show you, actually, right up there is the Apostolic Palace. And maybe I can tell you a little bit about St. Peter's as we are walking by. In fact, the anniversary of the beginning of the construction of St. Peter's is tomorrow, April 18th, 512 years ago. So it's a, so obviously the early um, 1500s. Now it was completed in the mid 1600s and uh, as was the colonnade, Alexander the, the seventh is the one who, who did that. We have a lot of people here already this morning, my goodness. Uh, so we just finished our prayers, prayers for another great day here at the Vatican Secret Archives. Let's make our way through the colonnade. It's a pretty spectacular place. You can see behind me the, the wall that connects St. Peter's all the way to Castel San Angelo. This was an escape route for the popes. And uh, actually it's still is something that works even to this day. So now I've actually, without you realizing it, have walked out of Vatican City State, one country. Now we're in the country of Italy, just that quickly. <coughs> so as we walk this way, to my left, something that many people don't realize, these are the Vatican secret archives. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got ahead of myself. This is the barracks for the Swiss Guard. In fact, as we walk in, there's some Swiss guards right in there. I think they're, uh, th that's, in fact, I hear a German over there. In fact, right over here to my right, the third floor, that's where Cardinal O'Brien lives. Remember Cardinal O'Brien came over to St. John Berkman's and gave us a great uh, thrill, a cardinal of the church being present when we had the, the unbelievable reliquary of St. John Berkman's, his heart. Over here to the right, that's a sad deal, but the, the army is everywhere. Um, just for safety, security reasons, especially right since the bombing the uh, took place in Pat. Syria. Okay, so now, Bomb. just this close, we're going to walk in, and I'm, we're going to try to do it discreetly. Here are the Vatican uh, <laughs> guards. <laughs> Super slow. Uh, 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 um, Archivio Vaticano. <laughs> there. <laughs> and Cheryl, turn it off as quickly as possible. And, uh, but, I mean, you, you can see it's relatively close to St. Peter's Square. You just walk out, walk through the colonnade, past the uh, Swiss Guard barracks, and, um, and you're there. All right, we're almost finished. So, but don't you pass back into the Vatican? Right when we, exactly, right when we pass the Swiss Guard, now we're re-entering Vatican City yeah. State. St. Peter's, St. Peter's Square is open. The, the border is open, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, open borders right there, but not when you get into the actual guts of uh, yeah. uh, Vatican City State. So, the... Uh, the audio of the next one is not that good, but you can at least see the courtyard of the Vatican Secret Archives and where many people take a break. Thank you. 
All the doodling that we saw on the documents from the, the from the 12th century, wherever the, the, the monk uh, scribe uh, was, and he had a great sense of humor, and uh, it was quite talented as well. And he had these Italians know how to make a copy of a machine like this. A little, little espresso, and then we're going to get back to work. All right. Whoa. You must have both of them on. One doesn't work, one does work. We got both of them on. Is that better? There we go. Anyhow, that was the break room. That's where you got your coffee, your water, even uh, other junk food in there. Um, just one of the, the, the courtyards off of the Vatican Sica uh, archives. Um, and I don't know if you saw what I was wearing, but that little square thing was actually the, the microphone that Bluetooths to the phone that therefore I can just walk through St. Peter's and the other people and I still had a great quality. I just forgot to turn it on as I was uh, preparing my coffee, as the machine was. Would you tell them a but, little bit about the doodling before but, you But what I was saying in there was that uh, these documents that we were looking at, the early 13th century, 1200s, well, the late 11, uh, 1198 is when some of, the doodling is what we uh, were just shocked at. Not uh, just, you know, basically, this was artistic, great, beautiful. It was not like these manuscripts, the illuminated manuscripts that are specifically painted to really look unbelievably spectacular. This is just the scribe, uh, you know, all of a sudden just, uh, oh, well, you know, and just, and a lot of them were just little animals, um, um, like breathing, you could see the breath, and then flowers came out of their breath uh, later. Um, some of it actually reminded me of Escher. Uh, any of you know the artist uh, Escher and, and how he takes, he'll take a design and kind of flip it on this side and then repeat the theme and then it just kind of, I was, I was really quite amazed at, at, the, at this unnamed monk uh, and, and his doodling. In fact, some of the scans that we got had nothing to do with the material on it, but some of the doodles were just really that great. Drawing is hoping to um, uh, the, the scans deal with uh, Pope Innocent III, his early years, and, and we're, we're making our way to the time period that was there. In fact, the third day, it was like, ah, I just want to go spend time in Rome. It's a beautiful day. Uh, it took only about 15 minutes into it, and I was like, oh my goodness, here it is. We, we, we found what we're looking for. We're on the trail. And then all of a sudden, it was like, like that. It was like, the day was over. It was like, no! I mean, it just, it was just really um, uh, unbelievable. We have the reference number of what we need to walk into the Vatican uh, uh, secret archives and just walk in, put it into the, into the computer right away before we even look at anything else and get the next book. I mean, we're, we're just literally that ready to go. Um, I will show you the one final one and then we're going to change topics. Can you only go three days at a time? Or no, you, you no, can go more than we had. three okay. days at a time. Uh, our pass uh, is good through um, June 28th. So then we exited the archives, and here's the final one, I promise you. All right, well, here's See the, the hills of Rome in the background. The Vatican Secret Archives, one of the ramparts, uh, just left there, and, uh, um, well, my goodness, we finished three days, three days, we probably needed 30, I mean, ah, we just ran out of time, we have a flight to catch tomorrow, got to get back to the United States, we are hot on the trail, though, that, that's the great news, we're hot on the trail and finding out more and more about the relics of Constantinople right after the sack of Constantinople in 1204, now, did I see the actual word? 
or shroud or burial cross? No, but, but, we're all, but we're looking for relics in general, and yes, the shroud in particular. It's, just so, it's been so great to be in the Vatican archives, to see all the history. I mean, the letters that go all the way back to the beginning. I mean, that's why it's considered the most extensive of all archives in the world. And it's been a great privilege, a great honor, and I really appreciate you joining us. And I will say this, when I had a little bit of time to myself, I actually looked into the canonization papers, the, the actual original canonization papers regarding the miracle of Grand Coteau. Any of you who know me well know you're not surprised that I wanted to see those as well. But I just asked for it. They, they brought out a box, took a look at all the different letters out in New Orleans. Uh, it was really super great. Anyhow, uh, you got to go down this hill and, and leave Vatican City and uh, start to pack and get ready to come home. Uh, again, thanks for joining us on this journey. Till the next time. Yay! That's over. So, um, it really was quite exciting to be in there, if you couldn't tell by my voice. <laughs> All right, let me get to the next. Hmm. Okay. So any final uh, questions, comments about the, the archives? Yes. So you are going to get to go back? Um, do you have any kind of timeline? Or is there a limit? Okay, you're here, you can't come back for another five years? <laughs> no. Um, um, once the, once the card is, uh, expires, then quite literally you just go in and, and they, I mean, and, and that's what happened with Dr. White because she had already been in there before. She presented the card. Um, they didn't even take a new picture of her. Which is good. Which is good, she says. <laughs> and, um, and, and she has the new dates. And so for me, I, I had to sit down and actually had to scrunch down. That was kind of funny. Um, to get the picture taken, but um, I don't know if there's, uh, I hope there's a point in which they're going to recheck my credentials and, you know, but, um, but it was super easy for her to get hers renewed and hopefully it'll be the same for me. I can foresee any visit to Rome henceforth that I'll, I'll always just kind of go in and say hi and get a new card. And, um, <laughs> But, but there is no sp uh, set plan at this very moment to go there um, and, and continue the research. Did you have to pre-register like, when you were in the States to let them know you were? Oh, yeah. we, uh, when, uh, we let them know the dates in which we would want to enter into the archives. They gave us those three dates. And when we walked in, our name was on a list for the day and, uh, and each of the days. And it had the time frame within which we were able to, to be there, and and so yeah, it was it was pretty, it was pretty strict. Yes. Can can the general public go? They fly? No, uh, it's just it's. Uh, in fact, I've been quite surprised that there's some unbelievably great um, academics out there. Uh, with multiple doctorates and whatever else who have been denied and consistently denied. In fact, I, I will say this, the Shroud community is a little bewildered by me and Dr. White. <laughs> they really are. People who have been at this a lot longer than we have are like, how do they get access? <laughs> I mean, the, the, I mean, seriously. It, um, Barry Schwartz, when he was here last month, he said, you two have created quite a stir. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, their blogs and the, the, the comments and everything, like, and it's, seriously, it's like, who are these two guys? Um, and I, I, yeah, I think a lot of it is divinely ordained, certainly. Um, but it, it's not just that you have to have X number of doctorates or whatever. The fact that I studied in Rome for five years, I had the certain um, JCL, the, the, the canon law degree that I have from one of the pontifical universities there, had a, a letter from um, a university, uh, as in LSU, stating that 
that I am someone who can do research or whatever that letter stated. Uh, that's all it took. But, and you had to have the right reason for going in. So, uh, just very, very, very briefly with regards to the actual miracle of Grand Coteau, the title of today's class. Um, but I knew that I would be talking with you today. And so to, to take a, a quick little glance at all of those uh, records in the Vatican, um, it was really neat, very exciting, but just as the quickest of reminders, in 1865, venerable John Berkman's was beatified. So we have a brand spanking new blessed on the calendar of, of, of saints and blesseds. Uh, this is during the time of Pope Pius the, the Ninth. It was Pope Gregory the uh, 16th who declared him better, um in the 1700s. Um, therefore, not Gregory the 16th. It must have been 15th. Anyhow, um, so 1865, what's going on in the United States of America? Civil War. And, and indeed, even in our state, that was going on, and the, the um, Sacred Heart Convent down south and the Jesuit um, community there uh, were basically spared any of the, um, um, whether the horrors of war or just the, uh, uh, the, the Union Army coming in and wanting to kick everyone else out and, and they taking over that particular place as happened in other places in South Louisiana, including Catholic institutions. Um, there is a, a neat long story about all of that, how one of the sisters had a relative, I think in St. Louis, and it all worked, where the letter got to the Union troops and, and they couldn't go in. So while that was going on, there's this young little um, novice, Mary Wilson, who arrives. She actually is from uh, originally uh, Canada through Pennsylvania and St. Louis made her way down to New Orleans but because of the climate in New Orleans uh, went to Grand Coteau to be with the sisters there and so uh, she ends up uh, getting quite ill deathly ill in fact it became apparent that wait that, that this is indeed um, uh, something that could be fatal and they sent for the doctors of Opelousas to go and to, and, and to, to care for her they went, and it soon became evident that she indeed is on her deathbed. Um, she wasn't able to eat for uh, any number of days, and uh, um, apparently she was uh, quite emaciated, like always in a fetal position. Her tongue was so swollen that she couldn't even take water, couldn't even take Holy Communion. She desperately wanted to receive Holy Communion, but that was itself even an impossibility. So they start praying through the intercession of this newly beatified John Berkmans. The connection is to the Jesuits who are just a mile away, who knew everything about this newly beatified young man who himself was never ordained and never um, uh, fulfilled his, his dream, as it were, to, to be ordained a priest and to to be sent into the missions. He wanted to go to either China, like a lot of the, the Jesuits were at that time, or to come to the New World. Well, he ended up making it to the New World by means of an apparition. So he died at the age of 22. This, this young uh, sister uh, was basically the same age, and she wrote in her uh, autobiography, all I wanted to do was to take on the veil. In other words, to be to become a nun. And so they are praying through the intercession of Blessed John Berkman's to, um, um, to cure her. That God, through his intercession, cure her. And on the ninth day of a novena, all the sisters are in the chapel, they're praying uh, the, the, the morning mass, Mother Superior uh, left, went to the infirmary and just expected to find that she had already died. And the situation is, she's sitting up in bed. She's fine. She's speaking. And is saying, uh, yeah, I want to return to my, my former ways. I'm hungry. <laughs> um, and it was, I mean, complete, total, spontaneous, um, 
no explanations. Uh, the doctors today say it was probably some type of a tuberculosis um, um, uh, the, that had really gotten very severe, and she should have died. She should have died. So the, uh, everything was submitted to the Vatican. I saw the actual handwriting, as I told you, of the documents submitted, uh, the letters, the testimony of the uh, doctors. On a lot of the pages, it's interesting, um, it's as if they, they put a line down the center page and they wrote their testimony in French. Someone else came back and put everything on the second side of the same page uh, in Latin. And that was the miracle. Remember what she said to Mother Superior was, I, I saw Blessed John Birkins. There was an apparition. Um, there is no other Vatican-approved apparition to have taken place in the United States. Not of Mary. You know, we have Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady of Lourdes, all, all sorts of apparitions and apparitions of other saints, but this is the only one. It still remains to be St. John Berkman's the only apparition. Of course, there's two apparitions, because the second one, uh, a year later, said, okay, now get ready, you're about to die. I mean, she was po more polite than that. Um, he was more polite than that to her, but... Um, and she told uh, the Mother Superior, and then apparently she dropped dead of what we would say would be like an aneurysm. So something completely unrelated to the original um, diagnosis, the original disease. And so the, the actual first miracle of, okay, okay, ah, this is the wrong computer. <laughs> Well, those are the Tetons. All right, uh, Jackson. Uh, never mind. Because on my uh, uh, computer in my office, I have the very first miracle. The body of St. John Berkman's is, is laying um, uh, in the church on, on this uh, funeral bier. And um, um, you have the noble people surrounding him, you have the commoner surrounding him, and this one woman goes up, and remember, he, she takes the fingers of St. John Burke when she's blind, and, and a noble woman known to many people, and instantaneously she can see. That's the first miracle. I mean, it was right there in front of Vatican officials themselves, all sorts of people who knew her, knew her to be blind, and now all of a sudden she's walking away able to see. That's the first miracle. That's a pretty stunning miracle. So, any questions about Grand Coteau and the miracle of Grand Coteau? You probably have no questions because you've heard the story so many times. <laughs> Chris? Right. Yes, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, it is out there. You could probably even just Google it and find. Because as soon as all of this had taken place, she too was a part of the whole canonization efforts. A lot of what she wrote is also in, at the Vatican. And, but the Mother Superior said, now I need for you to write a first-hand account of everything that took place and, and yeah, an autobiography. Who are you? Who are your parents? Et cetera, et cetera. She did take on the veil. She did. However, she was never fully professed. So, so you know, there are different stages, and, and usually uh, in convents, uh, a postulant, someone who is asking to join a community, uh, wears something, and then a, a novice wears something else. Then you take your first vows, and you have the veil, and then, then there's a certain point in which you take your final vows, and she never made it to final vows. So in that, she is kind of like John Berkman's. And of course, you can go to Grand Coteau, I-49, right, right after Opelousas, before Lafayette, there's a uh, sign for Sunset and Grand Coteau, and I, exit what? Exit 11, there we go. <laughs> then take a left, go east. Now, I will say this, if ever you want to go, call ahead, because 
the, the actual site is still in the all-girls school that they have there. Yeah. So it's not just where you just show up and walk in. I mean, it's, a, it's a school. You know, tell them that you want to go. Tell them that you want to visit. Tell them that you're from the Cathedral of St. John Berkman's. Father Peter sent you. And I'm being very serious. All the sisters there know us up here. Remember when the high altar was put into, in, into place here? And the sisters came up here for that dedication ceremony. Um, and on the actual date of the, of the miracle, the 150th anniversary, not this past December, but the December before, um, on that date, you might recall, I literally took the heart of St. John Berkman's on I-49 and went down there, and um, for the entire day, there were approximately 4,000 people who came by uh, to venerate the heart in the actual shrine. Um, we didn't just go to the bigger church. I mean, that would have been too e easy. We did have mass with the heart and a hu uh, absolutely full um, gymnasium, and um, it, it was that was great. That was very good, but. But on that actual date, and that's part of the reason that the sisters uh, love me. So <laughs> I made it too easy for them. I just showed up, and, and they. So, anyways, anything else about the Grand Coteau? Well, yes. What made them the all the nuns pick St. John Berkman to pray to? I think that they chose St. John Berkman's because he was newly beatified. So here's this brand spanking new. Blessed, they all knew about him. Uh, all the holy cards had been distributed. They had a holy card. Mary Wilson had a holy card. She would kiss the holy card. Um, but remember, there's a Jesuit community just like an hour, uh, a mile away. So the Jesuits of Grand Cato they're still there. Um, it used to be their, their main novice house, and um, um, now it's more of a, of a retreat center. There are a number of Jesuits who still live there, though. Um, so, those were the priests who would come say Mass for the nuns just a mile away, and their daily Mass, and so they all learned about this, this young Flemish um, saintly person, and, uh, and that he had just been recently beatified. And at that time, today, we, we keep hearing more and more about people being beatified and canonized. Um, <coughs> Uh, that was not the case, yeah, even before Pope St. John Paul II. Pope Paul VI, yes, he um, declared a number of people saints, including one American, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, um, John XXIII, and, and those before him. Pope Leo XIII had the second longest reign in the history of all popes. He declared ten people saints, including our patron. So, I mean, it's a, uh, so, have you all, have you all ever seen the tomb of St. John Berkman's? Anyone here been there to Rome? A few people, good, great. I could show you that video too. <laughs> Anyways, all right, maybe another time. What, what I also want to talk about is um, what took place the, the first couple of weeks of April, because you may recall I went to the Holy Land. I've been to the Holy Land now seven or eight times. Um, everything from when I was a seminarian way back in 1989. Uh, I asked Bishop Friend if he would allow me to go to the Holy Land, wrote him a letter, um, uh, this is while I was studying in Rome. He said, yes, paid for it. The diocese, you all paid for it. Um, and uh, ordained a priest the next year. Um, and then it, it was about 14, 15 years later that I went back a second time. And it was in order to be part of a, an archaeological dig in Bethsaida, where Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Philip are from where a number of miracles took place. And remember, Jesus was upset with the people of Bethsaida. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If all the miracles had happened in Sodom and Gomorrah that happened there, they would still be around. Remember, he cursed uh, Bethsaida and Chorazin, and still to this day, neither of those towns have ever been rebuilt. Um, 
and never will be. Um, and then another experience of um, being there with 46 other priests for a month long, kind of like a little mini sabbatical of sorts. Um, just going to the different places, studying, reading scripture uh, at the different sites. And one of the things about going to the Holy Land, and this might even be kind of a pitch for you to think about joining me on my next pilgrimage, um, is that it is what uh, one of the main authors, early authors about uh, doing pilgrimages to the Holy Land, um, said is it is the fifth gospel. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the land itself, when you are there, and you, and where the Gospels come alive, and everything about the ministry of Jesus, and all of a sudden, you hear, you're, you're in the city of Jericho. It's a real city. And it's, and now you have a sense of the distance between uh, Jerusalem and Jericho. And those of you who have been there, what's the land like? Nice, uh, fertile, green, yeah, date fertile. trees, no. beautiful, flat, just flat. super nice, flat. Hilly, brutal. Hilly, brutal, desert. Um, it goes down to 840 something feet where Jericho is below sea level. And, and, and then you all of a sudden you read the parable of the Good Samaritan. Because now you're up in the Galilee area and Samaria is in the middle and Judea is below it. By the way, those three areas are mentioned in scripture uh, readings today. So whether you went to Mass or you're going to Mass at 11 o'clock, listen for, you know, and, and the, pe the people of Galilee and Samaria and Judea were all at peace. Did you hear that in the first reading? You know, uh, that's like the last time that they've been at peace 2,000 years ago. Um, so, uh, so learning about the, uh, the people, the terms, is this, a, is this a city, is it a region, is it a group of people, is it Old Testament, is it New Testament? So, um, um, yeah, if ever you have the opportunity to go on such a pilgrimage, and I keep saying pilgrimage because... Uh, uh, we don't go as tourists. We're, we're not there. I mean, we're there as Christians, as Catholics. Uh, one of the number one questions I get, did you feel safe there? And, and the answer is yes. Felt plenty safe. There were people who walked around with machine guns. But there were plenty of those people in Rome. You know, a couple of months ago, I had a wedding in New Orleans. No one told me to, oh, you know... Are you going to feel safe there in New Orleans? Um, you know, and yet New Orleans, are more people killed in New Orleans than in the Holy Land. Um, last year, I had a conference up in Baltimore. No one told me, don't go there. Uh, all the murders that are taking place over there. Um, it's the same thing with the Holy Land. It's just that we hear about the Holy Land, and uh, we know the tension, obviously, but I, I, I felt perfectly safe. There are a couple of people here who were part of that pilgrimage. Did you all feel safe? So Janet was there the last go around. Paul, Chantal, you all felt safe? Yeah, they they were fine. So so I, I would say you know don't let that uh, dissuade you if ever you have the opportunity to go. There, there's so many things online, by the way. If ever you want to, um, I mean, it's not the same, obviously, watching a video. Um, but uh, there's a lot about the Holy Land and professionally done, and not just, you know, YouTube videos uh, that we make ourselves. Um, all about the Holy Land, the, um, uh, the, the travels of Jesus. You know, so for example, uh, today's gospel reading. I am the vine, you are the branches. Where does that take place? John 15. It's, it's literally right after the Lord's Supper. Judas has already left the room. He says, I am the good shepherd. That was last week's uh, gospel reading. You know, the vine and the branches this week. So we're in the upper room. We're in Jerusalem. 
were on the Mount Zion side of, of uh, Jerusalem. Um, so again, it's, it's just a, it's an, a, a wonderful, unbelievably great spiritual experience to be, in fact, I, I'll, I think I'll just go ahead and mention some of that in the first part of my homily. Um, yeah, so. So, well, so the Holy Land. Well, what questions might you have about that, or any of you who went, your experiences uh, that you wish to share? Jane, I just like saying that uh, I expected it to be an amazing experience when I was there. What I didn't realize was when I came back, how life changing it was. Uh, every time I come to mass. Open the Bible. Um, I had this ten-year-old view of the Sea of Galilee uh, when I went, and now I know what it looks like. I put my feet in the water. It's just a life-changing experience, really. Right, and, and this particular group. So she was on the one two times ago. Uh, this last group, uh, most everyone just went in and went swimming. <laughs> you know. And since there are people present who saw what I did, okay, I went waist deep and I didn't go swimming all the way, but it was cold. That water was cold. And, um, but um, after each of the days of that, of the archeological dig a number of years ago, um, when we came back, that's the first thing we did. Still dressed with our dig clothes on and we just went swimming. So it sounds like a natural thing to do, but this is a Sea of Galilee. Jesus walked on this water. The storm took place. He's sound asleep uh, in the boat. It keeps talking about him going from Bethsaida to Capernaum, crossing over to the other side. Um, the, the Sermon on the Mount. You're sitting on the Mount. The, there's the Sea of Galilee. He says, hey, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Well, he's talking about the Gerasene city. That's right across... You know, you can, you can picture him right here. Hey, you know, city set on a hill can't be hidden. Look at it. There it is. Um, so it, it, really, it really does help. And, and I don't know if all, the, if all the people are for real, all of the places are for real. Um, I, I think it helps some people make a further leap to say, hey, well, maybe everything written in this, in this book, this Bible, is actually for real, too. Mark? Is the upper room known? So the upper room is the, the basic neighborhood, yes. They know right where it was. But it's not like they can say, in this particular space is indeed where the table was, and this is where they were sitting over here. In fact, on the inside of the, of the upper room, the, the cynical, you'll hear it mentioned uh, uh, that way as well, you'll see more medieval architectural uh, details inside of there instead of what you would expect from 2,000 years ago. But they know right where the area is. And by the way, this area is a very small area of Jerusalem. They know where he would have gone from to go down to through the Kidron Valley, and those of you who have been there now, you can picture walking down past Caiaphas' house, down through the Kidron Valley, up to the uh, uh, Gethsemane, being betrayed and, and, and arrested and taken right back up this road. Um, we know where the apostles were. For Remember, for fear of the Jews, they were locked behind closed doors and uh, the, the time of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, but the room itself, as, as it would have been 2,000 years ago, uh, it is not the same. It is in basically the same location. One of the things about the Holy Land is that there are, there are kind of three designations to every spot. One designation is, it is the spot. There's no refuting it. It's 100%, it's you know, the, uh, Jacob's well. It is Jacob's well. You know, you don't move a well around. Um, it, it's, it's been venerated by uh, uh, 
the Jewish people and now uh, Christians as well, it is the well. Um, the empty tomb, it is the tomb. Uh, the, the place of Calvary, it is the place of Calvary. Um, um, the birth uh, place of Jesus, Bethlehem, we know. Um, th then there's the, uh, a second um, uh, label that you can give to a place where the preponderance of evidence points to this being, being authentic, or at least right here in this area, and that's what the, the cynical would be. Number three would be its pious tradition, that it all kind of took place right here. So, for example, Emmaus, the road to Emmaus. We don't know where this little town of Emmaus is. In fact, there, there are several places purported to be that place, but we just don't know for sure. But when we go to that place, to the chapel, and they're actually in the variety of little towns that they think uh, where Emmaus was, uh, the, there are churches built there, and when you go there, you can still pray, read the end of uh, Luke 24, um, and still kind of enter into the mystery of, of whatever it is um, that we're reading. Anything else? Yes? Um, the next pilgrimage, usually I do these like every two years. So I guess it would probably be 2020. Um, I've been in 2012, 14, 16, 18. It's, it's a lot to get all of this organized. It takes a lot of time and energy. When I'm there, I love it. I mean, that, that part's kind of easy, usually. Sometimes people stay all the way in the back all the time. I'm not looking at Paul for any reason. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> At least Paul's friend was a six, eight. So I could look all the way in the back and was like, okay, good, I, they're, they're right there. <laughs> but uh, what I do with any of the pilgrimages is the first thing I do is I make an announcement at Mass. The people who are in church are the ones who are going to hear about the pilgrimage that I'm going to lead. I want to take parishioners. I want to take you. Um... Then I let it be known by means of the bulletin, and then after that, um, some type of a, a public announcement on the website. Um, but you, as parishioners, will already um, know when the next trip will be. Well, let's wrap this up then, this semester. Um, you got the white sheets. Please take those white sheets home. Um, Already put some of these dates in your calendar. September 9th, the Welcome Back Breakfast. You might remember that from last go around. And I wish to thank those who made presentations this past year. Uh, Ryan Smith, sitting here on the front row, gave us uh, one of our presentations. And of course, Dr. Cheryl White, any number of presentations throughout the year and a few other guests. And uh, But thank you for your participation, your interest in learning more about your faith and continuing your own faith journey. Thank you.